My name is Susan Foley. I am the executive director of a nonprofit for a form of autoimmune encephalitis called Hashimoto's Encephalopathy. Our name is HESA. Um, we have created this series on caregivers as we feel they are unrecognized and unheard heroes. Chronic diseases such as autoimmune encephalitis affect not only the patients, but the quality of life for the family and caregivers. Today, we're interviewing one of those brave heroes, Linda Norse, whose son developed a form of autoimmune encephalopathy called anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. I'm gonna let Linda talk as we need to hear from her, not me. Thank you. Good morning, Linda. Thank you for sitting down with us today. Um, Hessa is very anxious to bring awareness of how the caregivers and the loved ones and the family have to deal with caregiving of a chronically ill patient. Um, there's not enough awareness out there about what people go through. Um, can you tell us somewhat of your story, Linda? Sure, and thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity to talk about it. <clears throat> um, back in June 2014, about a few months before my son's 30th birthday, he was stricken with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, uh, also an autoimmune form of encephalitis. Um, seven years later, we, he is still battling this disease. So uh, he just had his 37th birthday a couple of months ago, and he is totally bedridden at this point. So and, and has been actually from the beginning. Just so sad. Uh, what happened, Linda? What, what, what were his symptoms that he had that um, brought him to this point? Well, to, to my knowledge, it started with, it, to my personal knowledge, it started with a, a very bad migraine headache that, that kept him in bed for a few days and he was unable to keep food in his stomach. But um, after he was hospitalized, some coworkers came to see him and they said, we knew something was wrong for about the last week. They said, because um, he, he just wasn't his normal self. But when we said, what's wrong, that he just said, oh, I'm tired or I have a headache or something but he didn't want to discuss it with anybody. And then I guess he didn't think it was anything serious. That's the problem. Yep. Yeah. So what, what um, brought him to the point where he's been hospitalized? What happened? Well, it's, his speech started to degenerate. I had noticed earlier in the evening that he, he sounded funny, like he was, he was repeating things. I mean, like right away saying like, I'm going to the store, I'm going to the store, you know, as if he didn't realize he had just said it. But I didn't really attach too much to it. But by the end of the evening, he was talking gibberish and his wife got nervous. He, I did forget to mention that he is married. He has two children who are now 11 and 13 years old. Just so sad. Uh, yeah, yeah. So his wife took him to the hospital and he literally has not left a health institution since then. Uh, once he was in the hospital, the um, psychiatric symptoms started. He was paranoid and, and, and delusional and he thought the doctors were trying to attack him. So he, would, he was fighting back um, and, and had to be restrained at one point. So, um, yeah, so that's, 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 that was so the beginning. Hard. Yeah. So, uh, Linda, how does this affect you? How, how, I mean, I know that sounds like a dumb question. You're the mom, <laughs> you know, but how does that affect you in your everyday life? Well, you know, it's, it, it took me a really, really long time to stop expecting him to just get up, wake up one day and get up out of the bed and resume his normal life. Um, even, even after the doctors told us that was not going to happen, I still believed it for a very long time. Uh, since then, it, it's just this, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, it's just a constant worry and, and fear 
uh, as I, you know, I've said this many times, I, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a believing person, but I don't know what to pray for. I don't want to bury my child, but I don't want to see him living like this. And I know if, I, I also didn't mention that he still doesn't have full awareness or consciousness. He's still in and out of coma. And I honestly believe knowing my son, the person he is, that if he were aware of his situation, he would not want to live like this. I didn't realize he was in and out of a coma. That's yeah. just, it's so hard. I mean, I understand totally where you are talking about that. What do I pray for? I mean, what do I hope for? You know, mm -hmm. I, that's the toughest part of all. I it mean, really is. It has it affected at all? I mean, this seems kind of a mute point, I guess, but has it affected at all like your income? having this son sick like this? No, not my income. Um, he, he got sick as it happens just a few months before I was, I was retiring. So I, I am retired and, and uh, have my pension. His dad is also retired. So um, that was not an issue. And, and mo much of the expense of his hospitalization is covered by Quebec health. Wonderful. So, and, and, and yeah, and did, yeah. And he did have insurance with work when he was working he worked in a in a hospital kitchen as it happens uh during the day but in the evenings he was he was cooking and baking towards becoming a chef he wanted to be able wow. to work for himself as a chef i you know i know it's hard for you to answer for somebody else but how i mean i can't imagine his wife and his children um how it must affect them and how it must affect you to watch them being affected mm. oh it's Ter they're, they're getting older now and they're they're getting better with it but wow at the beginning especially his son his daughter was only three at the time so uh but his son was just destroyed just destroyed and and i would have them over for the weekend and they'd be playing and being normal kids and then one would start crying out of the blue and then the other would start Aww. crying and i'm like what's the matter with having my daddy my daddy so, uh, yeah, it's been very, very hard. But um, <clears throat> his wife, I can't, I, my daughter-in-law, I can't speak highly enough about her, her strength, her positive attitude. And she keeps those kids so busy. And we joke, I have to make an appointment to see my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I understand that, though. Being busy is good. It helps yeah. relieve things that so go nice. through your mind. That's for sure. I, exactly. um, you know... <sighs> How, how has, I know you've got other children and how has it affected the siblings during this? Uh, David's twin brother, actually, um, they're, they're non-identical twins. And the brother is, they, I've always said the two of them are as different as two people can be, both in looks and personality. And his brother is mm -hmm. a very uh, strong person. And he jumped in right away and, and said, you know, I'm going to be his, his, his legal guardian. Like you have to go through the courts. I guess it's the same in the States. And so that there's always one central person to coordinate through. So he's doing that. He's up. My other son is also married. And, um, and he, although he and his wife don't have any children, but, um, but yeah, so he, he, he's just like the focal point and he's just staying strong for everybody. I remember when David first, first got sick and he was, you know, in ICU, it was his brother who knew how to talk to him whenever he had his episodes. And I, I, I was there when the doctor really congratulated him. And he asked him if he had any training of any kind because he just knew what to do that's that's the kind of guy he is he knows what to do so he's doing it and 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 you know just coordinating for the whole family well that's oh, kind and, of and as for me but, sorry I, I was just gonna say it's kind of like the brothers install um uh i can't think of the right word um you know their ability to know what's going on in the other one's mm -hmm. head you know that um feeling of um uh Here's my H-E coming through. <laughs> Empathy? Yeah, the there word? you go. That's what I wanted to say. Thank God. Someone's yeah. not sick and knows what to say. Um, but that that is, you know, that I think that ability, they kind of just have it. You know, they know. Mm. 
um, which is wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful and very comforting. Uh, my daughter uh, is the same. She's she's not taking charge, but she she just she she's a very spiritual person, and she just does her whatever it is she does to try to you know keeps to communicate with her brother on a different level because he he can't speak he he has the physical ability to speak but i think what happens is it gets lost between the brain and, and the mouth he tries but um he's not able to communicate that way so she tries to communicate with him in her own way why that's so frustrating for everybody um how long linda did it take for him to get diagnosed usually that's such a long, long journey. Yes, some of the stories I've heard are, are beyond harrowing. We were, I, 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 I say this very, very loosely, we were lucky in that David was diagnosed correctly and early. Um, in my memory now, it's seven years ago, but I, I seem to remember that it was something like three weeks, less than less than a month, I'm, I'm sure. That's amazing. It is. They, they, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, tested him for every known virus and, and bacteria. All those tests came back clean. Uh, it was only when they took a spinal tap and sent the uh, this fluid to uh, the States and, and he was diagnosed with anti-NMDA. So uh, the this unlucky part is that it didn't make a difference. It hasn't, it hasn't helped. Which He's is all, unusual. Very unusual. unusual. Yeah. He's had all the known treatments, the IVIG, plasmapheresis. He's had, um, what did I say, rituximab, uh, cyclophosphamide. Uh, he's had uh, three PET scans that I can remember. They couldn't find a teratoma. They, they, it's like there's no reason. Yeah, that's just so bizarre. It just Yeah, is. it's not hereditary. I, you know, um, he's also in the minority, <clears throat> isn't he, being a male? Right. Yeah. And his age. His age. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. it usually attacks, as far as I know, you know, mm. um, women or the young ladies, right? Right. Of childbearing age. Yeah. Yeah. Childbearing age. Yep. Yeah. Wow. I tell you, um, I just can't imagine sitting by a bed of my son mm -hmm. for seven years and watching and him not being able to communicate at all. I just can't. My heart goes out to all of you. Yeah, and I go, my heart goes out to all the caregivers who are taking care of their patients, their loved ones day to day by day at home. Um, I None of us has had that experience because David has never left the hospital, as I say. But I recently, because he had a recent, he recently had a very serious setback. And we thought this was going to be the last one. Uh, and of course, he's still with us. But at one point, he was in a tremendous amount of pain. And that kind of answered my question, what to pray for is just let him not be in pain. Just let I him understand pain. that. What was causing the pain, Linda? Did they know? Yes, they do. It's because uh, this recent setback, as I mentioned, uh, was vomiting and aspirating. So he did some damage to his lung, both his lungs and his stomach. He developed an ulcer and uh, those things were paining him apparently. Also, he has bed sores. I, I didn't mention that before, which he shouldn't have, but that's a story for another day. But apparently, yeah, they're very serious. And um, so he's, he's, they're treating him for the pain and well what can you recommend to people that would find themselves in the same position having a loved one diagnosed with um any type of, of autoimmune encephalopathy or encephalitis what what would you tell them i would tell them just bug the doctors don't leave them alone get as much information as you can and don't be like me i did not uh take a, keep a journal and I really, really regret that. I know some people do, and, and those who don't, I would encourage them to do it. Just keep track of everything. And, and you never know what, what one little incident will bring up that will maybe help get a cure. I will agree with you totally on that journal. Mm -hmm. I myself did it before I was diagnosed, and I kept that journal, and I wrote down everything, even things that didn't seem important mm -hmm. I mean it seemed like well that's nothing but I wrote it all down because I thought mm -hmm. there's something wrong but they're not finding it it mm -hmm. has to be something to do with 
all the symptoms I'm having. And um, it did help. It did help, you know, Absolutely. it, um, yeah, it helps. I know that you also volunteer and you're a big part of the um, foundation for NMD. I always say it wrong, excuse me. <laughs> Anti NMDA receptor encephalitis. Right. The, the original foundation, right? right. How, how yeah. did you get involved with that? I think I must have found out about them through Facebook. I'm really not sure. Um, because once again, because I don't keep a journal, my memory is no good at all. Well, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I did find out about them early on, however it happened, and um, have never, you know, been out of touch with the founder, Nesreen Shaheen, and followed all that they do. I've been able to participate in some of their fundraisers and have some of my own. So they're doing wonderful work trying to promote um, awareness and, and research. And they have um, yeah, prizes that they award. To, I've, now I've forgotten the name. It's CNSF, Canadian. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Sorry, Nesri. I can't remember the name. <laughs> That's all right. She's a sweetheart. Yeah. She wouldn't, she'd understand. <laughs> yeah, she will. But it's, they're doing amazing work with doctors and, and, and uh, scientists trying to get more research, more awareness, and hopefully, hopefully one day a cure. I think that's one of the most important thing is the awareness to mm -hmm. get doctors to research and get the scientists to research these um, autoimmune encephalitis because there just isn't enough. There isn't enough, but at least to make them think about it, awareness to think about and not dismiss. This is the hardest, as you know, the hardest thing is correct diagnosis. And because the symptoms are appear to be psychiatric, too many doctors jump to the conclusion. And I've never understood that. If somebody has been perfectly normal their whole life, and then one day they're behaving these, they're you know showing these symptoms, how do you think that it, it's oh they just they're just now schizophrenic today, not yesterday, oh. but today they are, and let's give them pills. I uh, understand that totally. I I remember a um. Well, it's on YouTube, on Hesse's YouTube, the yeah. symposium from New York. Mm -hmm. And the one Dr. Marks talking about, you know, he's a neuropsychiatrist and talking about that one patient that was in a hospital, a mm -hmm. neuropsych hospital for years. 20 years. And yes, you remember what I'm talking about. And they yeah. found out that mm -hmm. she had an autoimmune encephalitis. And to me, that has stuck with me. Mm -hmm. forever. Yeah, yeah. So sad. How many more are there? That's what you think. You can't help mm -hmm. but think that at all. But um, I, you know, I really appreciate you talking to me. Um, is there anything else that you would like to bring up or to say, Linda? Yeah, I, I do. Because, I, you know, I actually hesitated about um, doing this interview because I felt that it would have been better if I could say, oh, well, now everything is perfect. My son is great. You know, um, the fact that it's not a, a happy ending kind of made me hesitate. But I just want to say to the people out there who are still, especially who are still struggling, uh, have maybe just been diagnosed, don't lose faith. You know, not every case is like this. I think many of the cases are happy endings, or at least moderately happy, because I understand some people do uh, recover, but with deficits, but it's, uh, many are able to can still live a normal life. So don't give up hope. Just believe if you if you're a believing person, then just keep praying. Otherwise, just stay positive. I agree with you. It's not all negative. It's not no. all, but I do think it's really important that you did share your story because you have to show that part of it too, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. people need to know and be aware. And it, if it makes somebody push harder on the doctors to find out what's wrong, then mm -hmm. you have done a great service to people. Thank you, Susan. No, I, I we really appreciate um you sitting down with us today and um, hopefully, you know, whichever way it's supposed to be in mm -hmm. God's hands that yeah. your son finds peace somewhere along the line and you do as a family too. 
Thank you very, very much. And bless you, Susan. Thank you for Thank the opportunity. You, you bet. Bye-bye now. Bye for now.